All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to part two of this really important conversation beyond the board's statement, how do boards join the movement for racial justice, the remix. Many of you were with us last Monday for part one of this conversation. Over 1,500 people joined us for that, and we know that many hundreds of you watched the recording uh, since. So we're just thrilled uh, that you're part of this conversation and especially grateful to Robin and Vernetta for saying we're willing to host this conversation and inform it uh, and put our hearts and souls into this at, at this time of social movement and social change. So thank you, Robin and Vernetta, for being here, coming back. Um, I'll also say that Robin and Vernetta, um, not in addition to their own design of the curriculum, absorbed hundreds, I think some 600 questions and comments um, that you all posted in the Q&A box in session one as well as the evaluation results, which were several hundred more answers to the question, what would you like us to cover? So this is uh, anything but off the shelf. Uh, Robin and Vernetta uh, spent some real serious time this week pouring through those questions. And the exciting thing is, is you're gonna see them, themes of those questions pop up over the next 90 minutes. So good news, those have informed the structure. Um, and Robin and Vernetta are also gonna take questions as time permits today. Welcome to you both. Session logistics, for those who may not be as familiar with how we do things here at NPQ, we always record our sessions and you will be sent the slides and the recording within a few business days. We love it when you join the conversation on social media. If you do, please use the hashtag NPQ boards. The chat function has been disabled, but the Q&A box is there for your questions and comments. And as I mentioned, uh, we, we poured over those and they have informed the structure of today. And also the evaluation form that pops up immediately following the webinar is critical feedback, both for our presenters and for NPQ. So thank you for taking just a minute afterwards to do that. Again, the hashtag is NPQ boards and you see our handles there, NP quarterly. Robin's uh, handle is Sage Network and Vernetta's is Vernetta Walker. So please do reference those. Let me turn it over to the two of you to introduce yourselves and kick us off. You wanna go first, Robin? <laughs> All right, sounds good. Well, hello everyone. We're excited for those of you who are joining us uh, for the second time. Uh, thanks for your commitment to this work. Uh, we got just such great um, responses and even interactions afterwards. Uh, just by virtue for those who didn't get to meet me last time, uh, I'm Robin Stacia. I my company is Stage Consulting Network, and I've been at, at this for over 20 years. Um, a big part of the work that I do is uh, working with boards and executives, um, helping them to really lead strong organizations. I focus on governance and diversity, equity, and inclusion is governance. So it is a part of the board's role and responsibility. So a big part of my work work is with organizations around uh, DEI and equity action plans. Another big part is around board governance uh, transformations and achieving excellence. And then also I do quite a bit of succession planning, but I see them all related. And equity is a consistent thing throughout all that work. And Vernetta and I go way back. We've been partners through multiple organizations, so I'm excited to be with her, her today. Yes, and thanks for that segue, Robin. <laughs> we are very much aligned in our thinking on this work. I am an attorney by training, uh, but and I started as a practicing attorney and then made a, a very intentional shift into the nonprofit sector. And once I started working with boards, I have not turned back. My work in the area of diversity, equity, and inclusion stems from a very fundamental and core belief that this work is a leadership imperative. So when I think of my work with boards, when I think of my work with organizations focused on governance, I feel as though diversity, equity, and inclusion has to be a part of the conversation. And that's what brings us to this webinar, um, part two, the remix. Uh, we, we, Robin and I, um, individually and collectively, we've been receiving a lot of questions about where do we start? How do we do it? Uh, what are the first steps? What are the first pra best practices? There's a lot to unpack. And we also realize that there's tons of information that uh, 
if you're just starting out, it might feel a little overwhelming to navigate that. So hopefully we can save you a couple of steps and get to the heart of that, the matters. Next slide. All right, so last week, and it feels like it was a long time ago, but it was just a week ago. Um, we just wanna recap how we got here. We got here because um, we are at a point in um, our collective experiences where so many things are coming together that all point to the same issue. Um, so whether it's COVID-19, um, or the economic downturn that resulted as a result of COVID-19, or once again, us faced with the brutal reality of um, murders of unarmed um, Black people at the hands of policing. We all got to this place where we had to experience uh, these horrific realizations together. Uh, and in doing that, um, we really felt that it brings nonprofits um, into a place where we want you to join this conversation. So this is a national discussion. We're seeing it in protest. Um, we're seeing it in um, what we call the statements, the corporate statements, the corporate reactions. And Vernetta and I really felt that this is a place where we want nonprofits to feel strong and to feel capable of joining um, in and understanding um, really what this conversation is about. And so this slide you're looking at really represents um, just some of the aspects of the conversation that we shared last week and that we're going to build on today. Next slide. So also, it's part of the recap. We did a debunking of some common myths. And that's what I'm going to talk about because the other two items that we talked about last week are there on the screen. But we took a much, we took a closer look at, is this a matter of only a few bad actors that have really caused the world to get up in arms and say, hey, enough is enough. We want to do something about it. Or is there something more systemic in, at hand? And definitely, it's systemic racism that we're seeing, uh, very different from this being just a few bad actors. We also talked about systemic racism and what that is. How do you recognize it? How do you address it? And the fact that there are multiple systems involved and there's some intersectionality going on between race and um, wealth, education, et cetera. Uh, and the last myth that we took a look at was, I'm just gonna say all lives matter. Uh, and the point, uh, and I saw that some of you picked up on this on social media, was that we, of course we believe all lives matter, but we're saying black lives matter ver very specifically and intentionally because unless and until black lives matter and we stop seeing these instances of violence against black bodies, we can't say all lives matter. So when we make Black Lives Matter, then it becomes a reality. Next slide. Great. So today, um, we've got kind of a three-part uh, layout here that also is built around questions. So again, you're going to notice the themes from all the questions about how to operationalize this work that you asked last week peppered throughout this presentation. So the three parts are getting started. There were a whole set of questions about where do we begin? And, and that is also a metaphoric statement. I see some comments in the Q&A already about I, I, I wanna, I'm already started. We mean getting started also in the deeper sense. How do you get a whole group of people to dive into this work? So it's bigger than just day one. It's getting started, right? Getting in the movement, figuring out how to operationalize this. And then applying a race equity lens um, generally and in the boardroom. What does that look like? Um, what are the kinds of mindsets and activities we can engage? And then how do we make it part of governance going forward? Robin, you started today by saying equity and inclusion and a racial equity lens is governance. So how do we operationalize that um, throughout our governance work? So that's our layout for today. And I'll turn it back over to you. So let's talk about, um, this is one of our questions. 
uh, you'll see throughout this presentation, our conversation today, we're gonna, we pulled out questions that we think um, represents kind of the composite or the collective of the questions that we experienced, that we received. And one of them, and we're gonna start right with this, is what are some of the actionable ways to change our thinking and culture? And, um, and then Vernetta's gonna pick up a little bit on that um, as well. So, you know, this is a difficult one. It's difficult because thinking is such a personal um, journey. It's very individually driven and um, whether or not we can really impact one's thinking is something we certainly aspire to, but not something that we fully control. So um, when Vernetta and I huddled and we thought about this, the ways in which we believe we impact thinking, it's achieved really when we expose board members to information that is um, really important to them, but more importantly, when we expose them to experiences. So if we go back to last week, in our eight minutes and 46 seconds, we saw a wave of folks who changed their thinking, not just individuals, but corporations who changed their thinking, not because we said anything different to them, but because they experienced something different. So we really want board members, and I say this with all of my board, to get out of the boardroom. If you want to lead your board and help your board to be more in touch to what equity is all about and what in your community is important, we want them to, as Brian Stevenson said, get proximate to the issues. We want them to have conversations with folks in the community. We want the board to become better aware of the perspectives, the barriers, the aspirations, and how your work is or is not helping or contributing to what those in your community really want. And we want then for you all to have very meaningful and thoughtful and honest discussions about what this means for your work. And then when it comes to culture, you know, we want you to begin to really think about how the culture of your board supports openness, differences of opinion, that allows you to express your thoughts about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you know, and one of the things that we really want you to have, of course, is that diverse board, but let's say you're not starting with a diverse board, you still have to have a space in your board where differences of opinion can be shared. Um, you know, an example of that is that I worked with a group um, and they thought that they were doing really quite well. They had a diverse board, they had a diverse staff, but through our review, um, we uncovered that many of the staff and the board members were unhappy because the culture was a culture of decisions being made behind the scenes. The executive and the board chair said, no, 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 that's not true. We bring every decision to the board, every decision to the board. We just don't understand this. So in fact, they weren't bringing every decision to the board because they were having these very casual and informal conversations with people whom they felt comfortable with. And in those conversations, they were actually teeing up ideas and vetting through ideas that then moved further along the development range before it got to the board. Well, who were some of those people they felt comfortable talking with? Well, they were both white women and they felt really comfortable with the other white women on the board and the other white women on staff. And they, in fact, often had casual and formal conversations with them much more frequently than they had conversations with the black women and the black staff. And so while they didn't feel that they were uh, making decisions before it got to staff meeting or board meeting, they really were. Because those folks who they felt comfortable with helped them further form their ideas and concepts and even teed up their own leadership capacity to do it. So often they were chosen, they were selected to be chairs or to be leads because in that early formulation, they were able to say, oh, I'm really good at that, or I'm interested in that, or I can do that. 
So these are ways in which we have to really look at the subtleties of our behaviors while not intentionally meant to create an, an unjust and an inequity. They did create a system that was unjust and didn't have equity for those people on their board who were black and brown and men who they didn't have that same kind of natural affinity with who they felt like, oh, I just enjoy talking to her. Uh, so that's a way that we really have to examine our culture. Uh, Bernetta, do you have anything yeah. you want to chime on to that? Absolutely. I was just waiting for a, a quick <laughs> action there. And there you I'm, go. <laughs> I'm looking at the Q&A box and a couple of things that I want to address right on the spot. Someone, but it keeps scrolling very quickly. I know someone asked about the Harvard Implicit Association test. Um, mm -hmm. What did we think of that? I yeah. recommend it because I it's do a too. great way to at least reveal our biases. And as we mm -hmm. said last week, we all have them um, and do it as a group. You don't have to bring in your, your results and share them with everyone, but there are definitely questions that you can tee up for a conversation. Something else that I saw in the Q&A box, someone mentioned that their board has been focused on race equity and they're afraid of burnout. Um, actually, they made, it was more of a statement. So they said, thanks for connecting this work to governance. Um, burnout, yeah, it's a lot to take in, but keep this in mind as well. We have a huge learning curve. Mm -hmm. So we have to continue having these conversations until they become, you know, just natural conversations. Right now, as individuals are leaning into the conversations, they're still uncomfortable and it still feels risky. It feels risky because there's still a lot of folks who say, what if I say something wrong? But we have to learn how to have the conversations. And the other thing that I was gonna say, and I know there were a couple of more questions that I, I wanted to address, but they, they've moved on. Um, I'm looking at the question that was posed by someone last week with what are some actionable ways to change our thinking and culture. And I know that one of the things we're gonna talk about coming up is data. Keep in mind, this is work that it's, I always say I approach it from a heart and mind um, point of view. Some people, I've seen people move to tears by data. Uh, and for me, I put that more in the thinking category rather than the culture and the culture all about how we feel. But also, Robin, you started, think, uh, you had posed the question about um, in what ways are, are, is their culture, I think, mm -hmm. conducive to this? Um, but there was a, somewhat of an assumption in there initially. I think there are some organizations that aren't paying attention to culture at all. And at I all. love the example, but being very intentional about that because culture really drives a lot of what we do. And it's quite often those unspoken rules, um, just the way, a way of understanding of how things are done. So we have to unpack that. So, so have we have, we have a, a, something we want to share with you that really helps to illuminate what Bernetta just said. Um, words, images, and actions are part of culture. So let's, let's hear from someone who dealt with that and how he viewed it and how he made some changes. So today I want to speak about why we chose to remove these four monuments to the lost cause of the Confederacy, but also how and why this process can move us towards healing and understanding each other. It is self-evident that these men did not fight for the United States of America. They fought against it. They may have been warriors, but in this cause, they were not patriots. These statutes are not just stone and metal. They're not just innocent remembrances of a benign history. These monuments celebrate a fictional sanitized confederacy, ignoring the death, ignoring the enslavement, ignoring the terror that it actually stood for. And after the Civil War, these monuments were part of that terrorism, as much as burning a cross on someone's lawn. They were erected purposefully to send a strong message to all who walked in the shadows about who was still in charge in this city. Another friend asked me to consider these four monuments from the perspective of an African-American mother or father trying to explain to their fifth grade daughter why Robert E. Lee sat atop of our city. 
Can you do it? Can you do it? Can you look into the eyes of this young girl and convince her that Robin E. Lee is there to encourage her? Do you think that she feels inspired and hopeful by that story? Do these monuments help her see her future with limitless potential? Have you ever thought, have you ever thought that if her potential is limited, yours and my potential, my limited potential as well? We all know the answers to these very simple questions. When you look into this child's eyes is the moment when the searing truth comes into focus. This is the moment when we know what we must do, when we know what is right. Well, what is right? Okay. So that was Mitch Landro, who was the mayor in New Orleans who one of the things I love about that video clip is that he, he, he was not um, an easy um, uh, person to convert. He did not originally want to take down any of those statues. So this is not an example of someone who came at this work already having bought in. And many of you, we got so many questions about how do you move people along the road who are not bought in? He revealed a couple of things to you. A, he talked to other folks, and we're going to talk more and more and more about that. But he said, I another friend said to me, another person said to me, he put himself in someone else's shoes. You heard him say that when he said, what if I were a parent and I had a young black daughter in the fifth grade? He tried to understand the historical context. We talked about that last week when we talked about the, the uh, case statements, the mission, the, uh, you know, your um, movement statements, they have to have a historical context. So he did several of the things right that in fact we've been talking about, but most importantly, he stood up for, what he, once he changed, he stood up and he made the actions. And many people say he didn't go far enough. If you remember in his first statement, he said why we are removing these four statues. Now, you know, there are way more than four Confederate statues in the city of New Orleans. So he didn't, he didn't do it all, which says to us, this work evolves, but we have to start somewhere. And he felt that those four statues that he chose to remove represented the, the, the largest effort that he could do to shine the light on equity and to shine the light on, on the vision um, for achieving an equitable community um, in, in New Orleans. So it's just a great example. If you go to YouTube, you can see the longer um, uh, explanation of his journey, uh, but we wanted to share that with you because it really tees up um, getting started. Yeah, so that's a, a great transition. Get And getting started, I've got, I have to say, when I was reviewing the comments or um, inquiries from last week, I feel like a third of them were, how do we start? Where do we start? Mm -hmm. And it made me think of something that I have often used for a number of processes. And you'll see the graphic on the right-hand side of the screen titled um, Carter's Eight Steps by John Carter, Harvard professor who has written a book on change management. A lot of people want a process. They want to know going into um, some type of transformational effort that there's a process. And when I say process, I don't mean that there's an end to it because I, I'm always very clear that this work is ongoing. It evolves over time. But I think that the very first step is a critical one, establishing a sense of urgency. Um, and your sense, the sense of urgency may be the protest that you're seeing. The sense of urgency uh, for a lot of organizations will be, how are we going to move forward in this environment? What is our relevancy? Will we become an organization that our community no longer trusts? Even having that conversation is very important because what you have to do is create a shared vision and then you can work your way on up. Um, you want to see who else is in, because one person cannot do it alone. So you're going to 
create a shared vision for a better future. I love a positive framing, um, understanding why you're doing it, why and what it has to do with your organization. And if I look at the first bullet on the left-hand side about using data, I'll go back to uh, my statement about how that really quite often opens up doors for individuals changing their mind, changing their way of thinking. And I just wanted to mention also that there, we have a lot of data, I would say, at our fingertips, but maybe we haven't really tapped into it or really collected it and taken a hard look at it. And some data you need to disaggregate to see how people are experiencing your organization a little differently. And that's internally and externally. So when I'm working with, with organizations, there are a couple of areas that I like to look at uh, for data collection. Those areas include, uh, for example, I wanna see what's happening at the leadership and governance level. And, is there truly an organizational commitment that's been expressed somewhere and, and where is that? Um, racial equity policies and implementation practices. What does the organization have with respect to any of those um, and what data do you have? Organizational climate, culture, and communications. So a good part of this is a review a good part of it is actually trying to capture what is the culture of our organization. And that's that piece where I said, are people really perceiving your organization a little differently depending on where they sit um, and whether or not they happen to be in a marginalized, uh, a part of a marginalized population. Service-based equity. How are we doing in that respect? And quite often, um, organizations need to actually do some type of survey or a focus group to get that information. Workforce composition, quite often we have that, but also there are ways of examining that data to see, uh, to take a look at turnover, retention rates, uh, and who's being hired and into what levels of the organization. Community collaboration really talking to your community stakeholders and understanding how they perceive your organization and whether or not you're working with them in a collaborative and equitable way. There's some other areas, but I'll pause right there and let, let's see. I was gonna say, yeah, Robin, I'll see if you wanna add to that. <laughs> well, you know, first of all, this, um, I just wanna give a, a testimony, <laughs> as we say in the black church, that Cotter's Eight Steps works. So last year, an example, I worked with a, a national um, association, which is a quasi-government nonprofit association. Um, and we did this cohort work, which were um, members in their association, um, boards uh, and executives who wanted to move their, their equity work forward. And we used the Carter's Eight Steps as a way to engage them around uh, establishing that sense of urgency. For them, the sense of urgency in the data really came from an awareness that they were entering into um, a leadership uh, deficit. Um, these are organizations that are mostly, mostly uh, white male driven, very baby boomer driven, that in the next several years, they are seeing next like three to five years, they're gonna see more than 50 to 60% of their leaders retire, both off these boards and as executives. And they needed to embrace the next generation that was coming along, but really didn't know how to. And so that was the sense of urgency that we created. Uh, with a group that I worked with in South Carolina, we did exactly what Vernetta said in that they created this huge database in partnership with others in the community. And then we had a retreat and we took a look at that data and the data was really emotional for them. They discovered when they looked at the data that most of the people of color who earned bachelor's degrees or more left their city. Wow. Why? Because there were no leadership opportunities for them. They discovered 
the rate of, 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 of attrition um, in many of the um, African-American families who, um, who felt that their children were not getting ad adequate education, that they were moving just one or two counties over and so that their community was in fact becoming more and more white. They looked at data that looked at healthcare outcomes. So we looked at all types of data. And I wanna tell you in that session, we didn't move so fast to uh, create our plan. We sat with the data. We did one of those age old uh, exercises called write a commercial. Based on this data, if CNN were to come and interview you today, what would the headlines be about your community? And man, those headlines were really awful. Those headlines were community fails to support African-American young adults. They leave city in, in droves. Community fails to support young families, children underserved, so they move away. So then we thought, what would you want this to say? in 20 years from now. And we rewrote those commercials. And so we were able to use data to help get them started and also to help them to begin to think about how do they challenge the status quo? How do they challenge the way things have been in this community for a long, long, long time? This is, if you were with me before, you heard a little bit of an example that this was the board where at first all of the board members came from the same zip code so they had a lot of status quo to challenge. And I'll turn that over to Vernetta. Um, Vernetta, can I pose a couple questions? To sure. Yes. yes. Sure. Um, would you mind recapping just the categories of the data that you especially like to collect? I know that there's more than that, but you mentioned a few, and people would love to hear that short list once more. Sure. Uh, it's around here somewhere. I should know it. Um, I know it's... Um, governance and leadership commitment, uh, for one. Um, racial equity policies and implementation practices. What do we have? What are we doing? Do we have any of that? <laughs> Organizational climate, culture, and communications. The communications you're going to review, um, climate and culture, you're going to have to survey and get some insights. Service-based equity. What does that look like? Workforce composition um, and community collaboration. Those were the categories that I had named for Thank you. data. And they're was, actually going to hear some more categories as we go through. We've got another, we've got a slide <laughs> just to how do you measure this success? So we're going to yes. go through that again. Perfect. And there were a number of people that asked about the Harvard study, and one person has kindly put the, the link already in the uh, Q&A. So if you're looking for that, it's in the Q&A, and we will also, it's not a study, rather, it's an implicit bias yes. assessment um, that people can take, as Vernetta suggested, um, that she did think it was a good exercise for a board, and we'll include that in the follow-up materials as well. I happen to, if I might share very briefly, I happen to hear on an NPR show that Researchers have found that if they take, use that assessment, that Harvard implicit bias assessment with community members, they can predict the likelihood of police violence in that community without testing the police. This was just on Hidden Brain a couple of nights ago. So in other words, as you said, it's not a few bad apples in session one, Robin. It's a community change process, and they can actually predict police violence by testing the racial biases of the community not the police members. That's how much of a, a shared cultural issue uh, they were able to establish uh, with that assessment. So I thought that I just happened to see that or hear that on NPR the other day. Well, in yeah. fact, the, har the aggregate results of the Harvard uh, implicit bias data show that 70% of white Americans have an anti-black bias mm -hmm. through the results um, of that uh, assessment over time. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I think the more interesting mm -hmm. finding was that as do 50% 50 50 of Black. Blacks mm -hmm. also having a bias against yes. Blacks. And that goes to show how in our culture, yes. um, the images that we receive 
from the time, and Robin, we've talked about this, when you're really young, you have formed most of your biases by the time you were seven years old. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this is coming from images, whether it's TV, um, school teachers, just mm -hmm. our environment. So everyone, that's when, when we say everyone has biases, it's because we've all been exposed to them. And in fact, if even if you weren't born here, but if you have been here for in the U.S. for any period of time, you're going to be exposed to those biases. Right. And there's two places that you want to add to your list, two other resources. One is um, the beginning of the bias studies began in 1939 with the Clark Dahl study, which also informed the Brown versus uh, Board of Education um, school uh, desegregation um, uh, court case. And so I won't go into it, but I want you to Google that. And then the next is in 2010, Anderson Cooper and Soledad O'Brien did a replication of the Brown, of the Clark Dahl study, um, where they confirmed um, what Vernetta is saying to you about the perspectives that we have, the bias we have is formed very early. Of course, we know Dr. David Williams, who's at Harvard, also confirms that. But if you want to watch it in action, um, go to YouTube and look at the, and we'll put this on our, our uh, follow-up as well, the Anderson Cooper 360 mm -hmm. uh, replication of the Clark Dahl study. Um, I've used this with boards. I use this all the time. And I will tell you, I have people crying when they finish this, when they finish watching it, because it is so heartbreaking to see the responses of children um, to... Uh, to the interactions. I won't go too much into it, but it's, it's worth the watch. So let's, let's keep going. So I was going to talk a little bit more about, about um, status quo. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought you meant to keep going. Right. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, keep going on this slide. That's right. okay. Quite all right. Status quo, challenging status quo. So everything that we do here is challenging status quo because status quo is white dominant culture, period. Right. Uh, and to challenge it, one of the reasons that this feels so hard is whenever you're going up against status quo, that means that you're changing you know, the way people think, trying to change the way they think, the way they feel, the way they behave. And to do that is a little different. And there is a great, so there's a um, Heifetz um, who has written a number of articles about adaptive capacity, adapt, adaptive challenges. Um, he states uh, there's a difference between a technical problem and an adaptive challenge. In a technical problem, the problem is well-defined. The answer is known. Implementation is clear. A lot of what we're doing, we're learning things here and also kind of trying to dig deeper so it's not apparently clear exactly what we have to do. We know we need change. Um, but how do we do it when everything is so connected and ingrained? So adaptive challenges, and this is where some organizations really are strong and really leaning into this space. We know that the challenge is complex. The answers are not known. Implementation requires learning. Let that sink in. Implementation requires learning. And there's no single entity that has the authority to impose the solutions. So you're not gonna get a solution by someone who just has the power and waves a wand and makes the decision because we all have to buy into this on some level for it to work, but we have to figure out what that looks like. And that's where the learning comes in to really understand that there are different ways of doing things. There are different ways we should be viewing how we are proceeding with our work uh, and even the questions that we ask. So just that adaptive challenge framework is very helpful in this instance. Okay, articulating mission-specific commitments. I'm punt to you, Robin. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this really quickly. When you're getting started, uh, this is the place where board and staff really work collaboratively together. You, quite often, your board, I mean, your staff may already be working through an equity lens. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many organizations that I've worked with where 
the staff have already been engaged in training. So they may, maybe your organization um, addresses housing or your organization addresses, um, uh, 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 maybe you are an organization that provides uh, meals or that provides a, a food kitchen or uh, whatever it is that you do, your staff may have already been involved in some conversations about what we call the root cause. So what is the root cause of the, the essence for why someone might be homeless. Um, I know when I joined my board uh, several years ago, I was on a board for homelessness, and our mission said to eradicate homelessness, but we were not doing that. In fact, what we were doing was we were very focused on treating people who were homeless in their current situation. And so I said, well, what are we doing about the whole homeless issue? And they felt they were, but they were not. And so really getting your staff engaged and often what you're going to want to create that will help you along the way with this is called a theory of change. The theory of change is your organization's understanding about what the root cause is and how equity in achieving an equitable society will help to uh, eradicate eliminate the issue that you're working on in 10, 15, 20 years. That theory of change helps to guide how you work together and how you identify those mission specific commitments that we want you to make. So um, for example, I'll just give you one. Um, I worked with a, a, a health uh, organization and they were very much into um, health fairs, mobile mammography, um, you know, community, uh, uh, in, you know, pr providing a patient driven education. So all of that is great, but that's not root cause. That's helping that individual person or a community to have access to health care. And you can decide that that's what you want to do. But the theory of change around that is that that's what we call downstream work. Midstream work is work that in fact has a much broader impact. So midstream work is interacting at a community or at a generational level. And how do we determine how do we make changes? But real mission-specific commitment and real change happens where we call upstream. And that's work that says, what is it in our community that actually is creating the root cause of health inequities? And how can we have an impact there? So we want you to spend time with your staff. This is a place where the staff and the board work together in beginning to articulate what your theory of change, that continuum of opportunities for you, and where you see your organization fitting, and then crafting those mission-specific commitments that align with that, okay? So I know that was a lot. Um, we're gonna have some links again and um, our materials are going to help you be able to see great examples of this and um, tools that will help you get there. May I just Next add a place. comment based on the yeah. comments here? Um, one, it, I want to lift up a comment a little earlier by Julia, who connects to everything you just said, which is this is also an opportunity, this movement period, to revisit the way we deliver our mission. Oh, uh, yes. So it's, it's like this reciprocity, right? What you just said is if we look at the way we deliver our mission and we realize we are all downstream, um, then we have a chance not just to update our statement, but to revisit our mission. And so there's this back and forth, right, between understanding this data and actually revisiting your approach to mission. At least that's what right. she said. And I think it coincides with what you're saying. Right. And I see someone asked to please explain theory of yep. change again. And I think what we can do is make sure that we provide a really good explanation in the handout. But it's basically um, a statement that defines how your organization views um, what needs to happen in order to uh, eradicate um, or diminish the impact of inequities on those you serve. And so what is the root cause? So it's not just that someone is homeless, but is it, is it about uh, a lack of affordable housing? Is it that our communities have become gentrified? Is it that 
our city councils, and I'm talking about where I live here in Atlanta, sold city property to developers. And so developers were then able to develop city property for housing units that on the average sell for $300,000. Is it that there's such underemployment and that many families are involved in gig economies and so they're working on hourly wages and they don't have the ability? Is it that housing rates have increased well more than income has increased? And so you begin to look at the root causes of why we have people under bridges. And we don't have people under bridges because they don't want to live in buildings. We have people under bridges because of the intersection of all of these things have come to play. And so they have nowhere to go that they can afford to live. And so what's the theory of change for that? So you can still in the meantime, which we did provide housing and shelter, but you don't have enough housing and shelter for everyone, right? There's not enough housing and shelter for families. We know that. So what do we do? We have to create a theory of change that allows us to interface at that top of the level, at that upstream level, where we're interfacing with our counts, our city councils, our, um, our, uh, uh, our housing commissions, you know, our de city developers, um, those people who swoop in from right Boston and Florida and they come into your community and they build these units and they make great profit and they agree to have a certain percentage that are low income, but they actually never, never do that. And no one holds them accountable. Your theory of change speaks to that. And it tells you what you know needs to happen to solve the problem of the growing people living in tents under your bridge. And then you act on that theory and you get things done through being able to articulate that theory of change. Okay. I want to share, I'm reading or <laughs> trying to read the Q&A and this audience is awesome <laughs> in terms of what they are lifting up. Mm -hmm. uh, someone was talking about advocacy and the role of advocacy, pushing nonprofits to understand their advocacy role more broadly to push local and state officials for policies that benefit their clients, um, the, the clients that the nonprofits serve to help address inequities. There have been at least a dozen comments um, that uh, where individuals are sharing actual examples. So I just wanted to call, I wanted to call that one out though, for sure. And it is so hard. You guys are just <laughs> fired up here. So um, someone said, what is that study again? It's the AC360 replication of the Clark Dahl study. Um, if you put that in, you'll get several really great links there. And I did put that in the box. So, all right. Next slide, please. So it's more of your questions from last week. Uh, how do you tell your board that they need to educate themselves? And I remember reading this one. Um, and working with a lot of boards and the individual who submitted this question said, you know, I have a, a board and they're really bright and it's hard to tell them that we have some learning to do in this area. I would say start with some conversations. Um, and the education and I, I also, okay, again, working with boards, I want to provide a menu of options to get this thing started. Um, and that menu, I have, I keep a list, an ongoing list, and I update it um, every now and then. And on my list of resources, because before I come in and have a conversation, I want the board to have maybe read a couple of articles mm -hmm. or watch, watch a YouTube. Um, one, I'm sorry, not a YouTube, a TED Talk. I know one that apparently Robin likes as much as I do because you keep mentioning Professor Williams. <laughs> David it. Williams, mm -hmm. uh, Professor David Williams did a TED Talk titled, I believe it's titled, How Racism Makes Us Sick. Mm -hmm. And that TED Talk, it's probably, I don't know, it's in the range of 40 minutes, 45, maybe a little bit longer. So that's a longer one, but I love it. And then there are also shorter videos, a lot of them TED Talks or maybe um, 
There are also quite a few on YouTube. Books, what's on your reading list? And right. nowadays I'm hearing everyone, boy, I bet her book sales went up. Um, White Fragility, Robin DiAngelo, because <laughs> everyone is talking about that. I like The Color of Law, um, the history, the forgotten history of how the government se segregated America. Um, have your book list, even do a book club. Sometimes we make things so formal and it feels intimidating and it's just another reason for people to say, I'm too busy to do that. I'm going to give you options of here's a five minute video, here's a 10 minute video, here's a two page article, here's a 30 page research report. Um, and especially for those and, and know your audience as well. So within our boardrooms, we may have some individuals who they really want the data, the studies, um, all of the research. So that's an option. Sometimes it's a matter of having everyone watch something. Um, these, there are a number of programs that are coming on. And just start off a meeting by, what did you think of that? Even if it was, for example, the clip that we just saw at the beginning of this webinar, it was three minutes long, four minutes long. What did you think of that? So those are the easy ways in. Robin, what, do you, what would you say? Yeah, so I'll add some strategies because both of these questions, we grouped them because they really align with each other. You know, the first is going back to how we started this conversation and that's to feel very confident, board chair, uh, executive director, CEO, that this conversation aligns with governance. And it aligns, as Vernetta said, this is a leadership imperative. I can't think of any reason why boards would say any particular conversation is off the table. They are leaders. And their job is to be in that room and to spend some meaningful time thinking in a strategic and in a generative way, which is what we call it. Not coming into the boardroom and really feeling, again, status quo, that they're just listening to um, the executive and the staff give them reports. But we want them to think deeply about issues that intersect with the work that you do. And this is one of them. Um, this is how you shape the conversation away from it being political or divisive. It is governance and it is leadership. The second thing that I would suggest is that you align it with your mission. I, again, I can't think of a single mission, uh, and I've seen lots of nonprofit missions, even, you know, of course, environmental missions. I, I, mean, I mean, last year, like I said, I worked with a government insurance risk pool organization. You would think, how does this fit? Well, insurance risk pools, R-I-S-K-S, risk pools, are those entities that insure our school systems. They insure our fire departments. They insure our police departments. They ensure all those things that places that don't get off the rack insurance because it's too costly. So they pool their resources together. Well, who are the employees that work in those buildings? Who are those people that they serve? A very diverse community. Even though the boards are predominantly white and the executives are predominantly white, those they serve are not. And so we have to align it to our mission and we have to align it to those that we serve. And we got several questions last time about how do we do this when we live maybe in a community that's predominantly white or predominantly small or predominantly rural. Um, we, not, none of us live in a vacuum. Some of us do live on islands, <laughs> but none of us live in a vacuum. And so the work that you do we want you to connect it to the larger community. And we want your organization to see how the work that they do can be informed by what's happening in other communities. And we also want you, I always say, I, I have never seen a community where folks uh, can't find a way to partner, can't find a way to grow, can't find a way to connect. And then as Vernetta said, again, looking at your data, and I would be surprised if there isn't data in your community that isn't skewed, even if it's a very small percentage of data, isn't it worth it in order to change the lives of those people, even if you think your percentages are small? And so it's really about building that case. And so I say to my board chairs and my executives, you have to be prepared going into these conversations. Sometimes you spend time in advance 
speaking to your board members individually before you launch these kind of conversations. You're teeing them up. You're doing a little bit of education in advance. And if you don't feel that you're the right person to do that, then you might have to bring in a guest speaker, bring in a facilitator, bring in someone who's going to help you prepare. But you can't not have the conversations because you've got a group that's challenging. Um, that's probably more the norm than not. Very, very few boards like, oh, yeah, okay. Most have some element <laughs> of hesitancy um, about going into this work. So um, those are just some suggestions. So we probably need to keep going. Yes. Next slide. It's, all, it's almost those three Great questions. <laughs> I know. Next slide. Applying a race equity lens. Uh, let's see. Am I starting us off on I'm this one? I'm starting uh, this one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we got lots of questions. Um, and we also want to help you understand how to integrate this within all aspects of the organization. And that's what applying a race equity lens is about, is how do you begin, you know, to kind of look through uh, that lens at the work that you do. So when we say um, that we first, we want you to center other voices. Um, and, you know, this has been happening a lot over the last um, few months. We've, see, we've heard other voices um, express to our communities, express to our police systems, express to our leaders what's important to them, how they feel left out or marginalized, how they feel the current system and the status quo has not been working for them, what they feel those injustices are, how that's created pain for them, how that's created a feeling for them that their lives don't matter and that they're not able to succeed. These kind of voices are present in every community and we have to listen to them. Each of you through your particular mission has voices that you need to hear. Um, and often what we find is that uh, at a leadership level throughout our communities, and I was talking to a friend about this the other day, just Saturday, for example, here in Atlanta, We've got a huge nonprofit and philanthropic community, but I will tell you at the leadership level, many of those people look very much the same. And they talk to each other all the time. And they have, you know, they socialize, they have dinner together, and they're the ones around the table. And so you have to be very, very intentional. How can you do this? You can have um, round table conversations. One of my groups in South Carolina had a roundtable conversation with all of the executive directors in their community of color to hear specifically from them. Another group that I worked with had researchers and they had a roundtable with their researchers of color to hear from them. We did focus groups with those researchers of color because their voices were being drowned out by the dominant. Um, you can do pulse surveys. You know, you can do opinion um, questions. You can do, as Bernetta said, larger surveys. You have to be very intentional at collecting the data, but also hearing the voices. Nothing replaces having these conversations. And don't forget your staff. Hearing the voices of your team, particularly your team members of color and how they're experiencing this work, how they're experiencing the work setting and how they're experiencing really what they're seeing and what's happening in their community, how that's impacting them. So some of the things I have here, you might hear those voices about racial tension, about heritage, culture, about what divides your community, what unites your community, um, what needs they feel are lacking and that they would like regarding healthcare, education, or affordable housing, what infrastructure challenges um, they feel need to be uh, eradicated, um, what are the challenges with economic development, financial development? So these are some of the areas in which important issues we need to hear from and we need to pay attention to. So that's what centering other voices is about. It's about getting into those voices that are not the dominant. So something that I would add on to that, um, and I heard you say the word listening, and that's so important because quite mm -hmm. often organizations think they are listening. Mm -hmm. And what I'm finding in this day and age is they're going back out to mm -hmm. organizations or individuals that they may feel are their community partners 
um, now they're hearing something a little different. And not only that, but these community partners are saying, you weren't listening all along. You mm -hmm. pretended to listen. Um, then you would tell us what you were going to do, but never really listening to what we said matters. So that's really important. Um, prioritizing and resourcing the work. It's hard to really prioritize if you haven't had some of these conversations. Um, when an organization, and I go back to, you know, talking about what matters, what is the vision, why are we doing this, connecting it to mission. If you haven't had some of the most fundamental conversations, it's gonna be hard to prioritize. But by contrast, I wanna share an example that really, um, I was so excited to hear it. I'm participating as a consultant in a pilot program and it's a race equity cohort. And there's coaching that goes along with this and we started the program last year and then COVID hit. And I had some calls scheduled with all of the organizations I'm working with and I wrote them each and I said, okay, I know things are really uh, you know, hectic right now. Everyone was adjusting to changing to working remotely, et cetera. And I said, so if we need to reschedule, let me know. And the very first email that I sent out, the CEO responded right away and, and said, if we can't figure out how to balance this race equity work at this point in time, then when would we ever do it, considering everything that's going on? That's how you prioritize. When you understand the importance and the urgency of the work that you're doing, and then making sure that you allocate time, if it's time, people, um, resources to get it done. So that was a really important lesson. And just, I want to emphasize a couple of things about race equity lens, because quite often we talk about it, but organizations and individuals aren't sure what that is. And there's some questions that really highlight how things are different when we are viewing our world and the work we do through a race equity lens. And there are a couple of questions that are common for a lot of organizations doing this work, such as, who is our community? How are we including the communities we serve in identifying issues or solutions. What practices can we put into place to ensure our community can be heard? Just listen, practices, so not episodic, but to make sure that we're always checking in. Uh, what resources are committed? What would it take for the community to see our plan, our strategies, and our outcomes as a success? Think of how many times you have created plans, you have your goals, your objectives, your outcomes, and you have not checked in with the community. So it's all been very insular, that insular thinking. Um, and might our plans, decisions, or outcomes produce unintended consequences for the communities we serve? So in going through these questions, and there are a lot more, you start to see how the work you're doing when you apply a racial equity lens, you have to really consider who's being impacted and how, who have you been listening to, who's left, who's not at the table um, and is not a part of these conversations, and what would you need to do differently to make that happen? And that should be a, a, a um, process that you apply to all decisions, policies, practices, and the work that you do. Okay, measuring the work, Robin. Yes, so I have been in the chat box, the Q&A, <laughs> um, trying to answer a couple of questions, and I hope that doesn't mess up the tape. <laughs> <laughs> our recording because we're supposed to be careful about having clickety clackety clickety clackety in the in the recording so uh but a, a couple i just couldn't resist answering um one is a person who said in the q a box that they started doing this centering the voices trying to prioritize and they lost a board member who just felt that that wasn't their role and my response was you're you're gonna lose some people mm -hmm. you might and that's okay. Um, it's, it's, it's 
more effective for you to work with the majority who are willing to go down this journey than it is to try to um, create a fit for one who feels that, A, this isn't the work they see him or herself doing, and this isn't the work they believe is the work that they signed up for. And that's, that's fine, that's fair, um, because each person is gonna understand the value of this work at a different pace. This gets back at thinking um, we talked about earlier. And so you definitely may lose people. Another person asked how small is a board to do this work or what's the size? Um, uh, I've worked with boards as small as three and <laughs> as large as, you know, um, over 20. So it's, it's the intentionality of the board. Um, the smallest three, of course, was a new organization just starting. We'll be growing that board. But it, 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 there's, there's no size that's too small. It just all depends on if they have the bandwidth to do the work. So measuring the work. Uh, Vernetta talked about this a little bit earlier, and you're going to hear some um, repetition. So, you know, hopefully you won't get frustrated with us and you're going to catch things uh, the more we say it. But when we talk about measuring the work, remember this work is internal and external. We started with that last week. Last week was the internal journey, journey and you're gonna to wanna to measure that. You're gonna to wanna to measure how your staff and board are coming along in their own understanding of what equity means, what diversity, equity, inclusion means, how they work together, how the culture is changing. And those are things like the culture surveys that you'll do, um, the, the, uh, the, the staff um, pulse surveys that you'll do, the staff engagement surveys that you'll do, um, your board assessments that you'll do that help you to measure the internal changes that you're making. Um, like knowledge and understanding and leadership accountability might be one of them. Um, you know, how you guys are interacting with staff board with your vendors, your policies, your practices. Um, you know, how you, um, the board and staff are, are working together in terms of what we call your constructive partnership, but around equity. So those are ways in which you're going to measure that work. And then your external work is going to be measured based upon your programs and services. And are they equity driven? And are there equity driven performance measures? And we've got some examples for that for you at the end of our slide deck that you're going to be looking at. And you want these to be multi-method measures and multi-level. So multi-method means that you may measure it from um, engagement with your clients, from um, measuring your data against your data over time, from looking at your data relative to the county or the city or wherever you live. Uh, multi-method could be interviews, right? Focus groups, um, uh, surveys, so different ways in which you get data as well. Um, another good way of getting data is from stories, you know, so asking people to give you um, their account of their experience and how they changed or what they wanted to change, but it didn't quite happen for them. So thinking about ways in which you can get culturally appropriate uh, and contextual information that's going to help you to measure your work and help you to be able to look at various variables about what's influencing your process and your outcomes. Um, you know, you can't measure something that you didn't set milestones for, right? So you gotta start there. You can't measure something that you, um, that you don't have some anticipated outcomes for what you're trying to achieve. So you have to have some benchmarks, you have to have milestones, and you have to have some sense of where you're going you know, what those anticipated outcomes are. And that's based on that baseline that hopefully you did. And then, you know, you really want to create um, an open and a su supportive process where um, people can trust the information. You know, I tell everyone that, you know, this should all be on your website. It should all be transparent. There should be updates on how you're doing with your work, both with your board, your staff, your community, and those you serve, because they're a part of this process. And so your measurement shouldn't be a secret. Uh, even if you're not reaching your goals, that's fine. Then you're going to say, we measured, we didn't reach our goals, or we went very, or the amount of improvement we got was not what we wanted. 
These are the things that we're doing to regroup. And then I've got a list and it's similar to Vernetta's and we're going to make sure you get it, but leadership and accountability. Um, you're going to measure your commitment to resources. This, this is the biggest thing that will sink you. And we're going to talk about budget. We got a couple of questions, a lot of questions about budget, but, um, you know, your commitment to these resources, your program services and outcomes. Um, human resources, that's your internal policies and practices, employee engagement and education, um, your infrastructure, you know, your community engagement, um, changes in public attitudes and awareness about your organization and the work that you do. Um, you're going to measure how you respond to incidents, right? How do you respond to a, to a crisis? How well positioned are you um, to engage when something happens in your community? that really is about equity or inequities, um, how are you positioned to respond to that? So those are just some of the things that you wanna have handy to be able to um, consider for your measurement. And you won't have to measure them all, but that's a potential uh, laundry list for you. More Stuff. questions. <laughs> <laughs> These all are right. your questions. All wow. right, so Robin, I'm gonna give you a heads up. We, got, we have to go a little bit faster. Okay, let's go faster. we know at the end, we have the one thing that everyone asks for the most. What's a statement look like? Okay, so, so let's just do one of these. Let's, well, they're, they're both almost the same. Let's talk about white fragility. All right, that's a good one. <laughs> let's do and that I was one. prepared for that one. Okay. And, um, and I went back to, so I mentioned Robin D'Angelo, and I went to, I had my book on hand, and Yay, I wanted to see <laughs> yes, exactly how she defined it. So I pulled it yeah. out. So very quickly. Um, what is white fragility? And according to uh, Robin DiAngelo, did she, and I have to ask you, Robin, did she actually, or, or Jean, did she actually coin this term? term? Yes. Um, okay. Yeah, she did. Yeah, that's when I first heard of it. Yeah. She says, white fragility is a state in which even a minimum amount of racial stress becomes intolerable, triggering a range of defensive moves. Right. I'm going to stop right there because she says a whole lot about it and then yeah. wrote a book. Um, but she, I want to mention, she says, these interruptions can take a variety of forms, such as suggesting that a white person's viewpoint comes from a racialized frame of reference. And that's a challenge to their objectivity or a person of color talking directly about their racial perspective, a challenge to white racial codes. And she gives us lots of examples. But here's the thing, we've never, we, because we avoid talking about race, we don't know how to talk about race. And there's, that's where the discomfort comes in. Now people are being challenged in their views and there's this sense of if I actually respond in a certain way, does that, am I a bad, there are a couple of things that are internalized, that there's this good, bad dynamic. I'm either a good person or I'm a bad person. And if you say that I am even in the slightest bit racist, then that means I am a bad person. And we don't know, white people don't know how to deal with that. Um, there is fear and guilt all built in. And if you haven't read the book, read it, because um, something else that comes up, and she has a whole chapter on it, White Women's Tears, um, where they'll say something and it gets challenged, and then they become um, not, well, they may become defensive or um, the tears, and then everyone goes to comfort that person. And she talks about how we really need to address these different situations. So there's so much to talk about here. We added it to the slide to elevate the fact that everyone should read this, become familiar with it. And even if you don't purchase the book, I know she has an article, talk, uh, a couple of articles talking about white fragility. Right. So I just want to add one. Uh, there's, there's a chapter in her book where she kind of describes um, what she calls the rules of engagement. And I just want to add, share one rule of engagement that I think will crystallize this for you. This rule of engagement says that as a white person, I must feel completely safe doing any discussion of race. That's just it. You I can be perfectly safe, safe and uncomfortable at the yes, same time. Right. Just right. because you're uncomfortable mm -hmm. does not mean that you are not safe. Exactly. 
So, so she, she really flushes it out. Um, it really fits with this role of a white ally because as a white ally, you are one of the best folks to call out white fragility. <laughs> You are, you are, you know, you are in a well-positioned role to model um, strength and being able to have these conversations uh, in an uncomfortable but safe way uh, and in openness that, um, that it's not white privilege to dominate um, every conversation that occurs, that what we have to do is to allow um, people to express their experiences um, from the perspective of people of color and um, white privilege really tries to create um, a barrier for that at, to protect yourselves. So white allies have a really great role in helping to facilitate conversations and spaces where there are people who are still very much exhibiting um, how frail they are. So the, it's a great read. Uh, this is a real situation. If we have more time, Vernetta and I could give you some real examples. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh my, of how um, we've had to deal with this um, with board members and with executives. Uh, so uh, it's something to be prepared for and, and not to take lightly because it can, um, it can consume a lot of the time and potentially derail uh, the conversation um, in order to deal with the issues that the person exhibiting white fragility raises to the group as the issue is like a smoke screen instead of the real issue that you're there to talk about. The issue like could be, yeah. So I mean, you said a smoke screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we have to really be cognizant of that. Okay. So let's go to the next slide so we don't run out of time. All right, so this next slide is about how do we align equity work across the organization? I love this particular quote. This comes from, I want to tell you, go to the California Endowment. They have been doing this work. You'll see this is a quote from 2008, and I think they've been doing this work since 2006. So they're very seasoned. They're very transparent. They have so many resources on their website. But this was a point when Doc, Dr. Ross kind of concluded something that was big, and he concluded that they really needed to step up their seriousness of their resolve. Um, and that if they were really committed to this work, that not only did they have to say they were doing it, but they were going to have to track and measure their improvement and they were going to have to make it transparent. And so this is just one of the results that you'll find um, on their website and throughout their work. And that's what we want you all to do that in order to really operationalize this, you have to resolve to do it. You have to resolve that this is a part of the way that we do our work. This isn't a project, this isn't a little um, program, but this is how we do our work and that we're gonna operationalize it across all of our organizations, throughout our organization. So in our performance plans with our employees, um, in our executives contract, in our board orientation, in our board um, roles and responsibilities, in our board identification and cultivation process, um, in our um, work with our contractors and our vendors, that we are gonna ask them how they apply an equity lens to their work. If you're a grantee, if you give out grants and you allocate resources in those grant applications, and more importantly, to those who you give resources to, so I work with a lot of grant lending organizations who, who know that they give most of their grants to white dominant organizations who then filter the money down to grassroots black led organizations. And so shifting that dynamic with the black led organizations are given the money and also the support to building capacity. So you begin to layer that throughout everything within your organization to align the work. Bernetta? Now, let's go to the next slide because yeah. there, there we start to really talk about creating the plan oh, yeah. and holding yeah. ourselves accountable. So this one, I, I know this is, we can't figure out what to call the squiggly thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> but again, uh, people like a visual to see how am I perceived, where do I start and what does it look like? We need processes. 
I worked uh, with, a uh, with other groups and we call them roadmaps. What's the roadmap? Mm -hmm for doing this, but this one is yours, Robin, so I'm gonna let Right, you... and so, and I use a lot of different ones, but this one mm -hmm. I made with a group, and the reason I like to use it is because it's unusual, <laughs> and that says to you, you can create your, you can create your visual. They did not want a roadmap. They didn't want something that looked linear because they felt like with our organizations, this is for the, the government insurance risk pools. We did, that's just not how it's gonna work here. We want it to be more kind of as if it's constantly evolving, and so that's why we created it to look this way. But the first step is what we've been talking about, build awareness and understanding um, about why we're doing this work and then engage in learning. What does this mean for our organization? What do we need to know? Then review your data, right? Your current state, but also we want you to look at historical practices. But for them, we really wanted them to review what's going on now. Uh, then they liked the word intentions and aspirations as opposed to goals and metrics. So I like this because it's basically freeing you up. Okay. We don't want you to feel like we're giving you a cookie that you have to make it this way. It has to be chocolate chip. You make it the way it fits your organization. And they wanted to use what do we, what are our intentions and aspirations? And then how do we monitor and measure this performance? And then you'll see we have this little cutout in it. And that's because we have to adapt for new people and new information. They felt that it was constantly evolving. We would always be training as we bring on new board members and new staff, and that we have to be adaptable to that and not feel as if, you know, everybody's going to come in right where we are, but we're going to always have to pause and reintegrate people into the process. So, you know, I like it because it's perfectly unusual <laughs> and, and your plan may be perfectly unusual and that will be okay because we want you to create a plan that's going to work for you. So next slide. We got a lot of possible names for it in the Q&A. So. <laughs> Oh, good. A squiggly and a today. pinwheel and a... <laughs> well, actually, we call like it this. a pinwheel. That's oh. what we call it. So thank That's you. That's people I'm, who agree with you. I'm glad it looks like that. That's what we call it, the no. pinwheel. Because my model, is, my model is a pinwheel, but this one is a jellyfish. There we <laughs> it go. Is like, it is like a jellyfish <laughs> pinwheel. There you go. <laughs> On purpose. Okay. <laughs> So let's, let's talk about, let's go to the next slide. We'll talk about some recommended. We're going to address both of these, which were the most requested items from last week. Um, so we want to show you, we want to tee this up a little bit. Okay. Resources. Uh, there are too many to list, but we <laughs> have a few of our favorites. Yeah. I'm going to go through this top row. Um, Awake to Woke to Work, which really takes a look at different stages of development in terms of our, um, the evolution of doing the work from just getting into it, becoming much more aware to actually doing the work and several different levers that you can actually pull across the organization or tap into to actually do the work. And there's the personal journey. Um, we look at the individuals, the staff, the management, senior team, the board, and different ways to engage. Um, in the middle of the top row, race and conversation, race equity and conversation and practice, what, we're, what I'm really teeing up here is not so much this report as the, the Kirwan Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity. That's usually one of my first stops whenever I'm looking for data. Um, their annual report and they, and they report across a number of what I just term quality of life indicators, um, the wealth gap, housing, um, education achievement gap, so economics, uh, ec the economy. So you name it, they're talking about it. Check them out, the Kirwan Institute at Ohio State University, fabulous resource. Last week, I gave a shout out to the Race Equity Institute. I need to just tweet about them. Um, they do a phenomenal job, as I said, of providing that deep institutional history lesson um, regarding systemic racism in the U.S. And this, they, you can actually download for free the groundwater approach, which Robin shared last week. So, Robin? So because of time, let's just go to some examples. 
Um, the other three you're going to love. You're going to love them. And we've got even more of those, but it's 326. So let's, we want oh my to give you guys some examples. I know. All right. So for a statement, this was one that I came across a, a little while ago. Um, it's the National Parks Conservation Association's Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Statement of a Statement of Intentions. So a little different. And I don't even have it all here, but I have it on two slides. So this came out last year, 2019. And the reason I selected this one is because I wanted to show you how they how the different groupings. So um, it's in order across the two slides, but I want you to see what they talk about. So they start with what they believe. And this is an excerpt. So that's my ellipsis there. They start by saying, we know our founders marginalized certain people. Um, and we, and yeah, they, we weren't always on the right side of justice. And so they say more there. Um, and like I said, there's more language. Then they go from what we believe to what we commit to. So as an organization, we will ground ourselves in the tenets of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And we start with ourselves fostering rep representational diversity, equitable practices, and meaningfully including different perspectives at every level of our staff, board, advisory council, councils, and volunteers. Next slide, please. That's awesome. I'll show That's you some... internal. That is so amazing. Yeah. What it. we will advocate for. So they're very clear in terms of letting you know what they're going to do, what's on their agenda. And that includes equitable access to national parks for those who have historically been excluded or have felt unwelcome due to socioeconomic constraints, biased or unrepresentative park interpretation, historical trauma, language barriers, fear for their personal safety, or any reasons related to dis discrimination or injustice. That's a mouthful in and of itself. I'm telling you. And like I said, I'm just taking clips because their statement is about two, is at least two pages long. Um, and also the full representation of the full range of stories of our collective American experience. They go from that to challenges we will overcome. And here they're really showing a good bit of humility. And back to we acknowledge by our path, we acknowledge past injustices, um, seeking reconciliation and learning to become better listeners. And they end the full two pages, the journey we will take. We hope the commitments in this statement merge our words and actions in ways that we will build bonds with, with others, inspire our staff, and grow to take risk and change how and with whom we work. So I wanted to highlight that. As you're thinking about a statement, and the last slide we ended with um, in the first week of the webinar had what your statement needs to um, have in it, they hit every point. All right. All right. Okay, next slide. And what's so amazing about this statement is that several of you asked, um, how can you make a statement if you haven't been doing this work? You haven't been on the right side. You, this is a good example for how you do that. You acknowledge where you had shortcomings mm -hmm. and you talk about what you've, how, what you've learned and how you've grown and where you're going from there. This one we thought was interesting because this one is about Ferguson. So this is the vision statement for the Ferguson um, uh, equity plan. And we're just including this. And in, this is their equity vision by 2039. So this lets you know that what, they've got a long-term plan, that they're saying we're, we're in this to do it. We're committed to this work. And they, they really talk about how they're gonna transform the St. Louis region um, that in a way that values all children, including every child of color, um, and by 2039, every child born across every zip code, and we know that there was a lot of um, focus on uh, the Ferguson community because of how they were uh, historically treated and marginalized, particularly by the police department, will live in a region where, and then they, they named their commitments. Now their plan further uh, delineates and details the strategies for how they're going to ensure full opportunities that equip them to thrive, 
where our systems are rooted in justice for all and where they are at the heart and center of our um, hearts, minds, and actions. So their plan fully fleshes that out, but this is their vision statement. And it's important to start with a vision. It's important to know what you want to achieve um, as you go forward, okay? So we're actually at time. Out of time, we are. <laughs> so uh, Jean, if you just flip through, they can see how many more examples we've got there. That's King County, which is in Seattle for you. Um, and then I think the next one is just audience questions and, and thoughts. Yeah. But we have your question. We have been chatting to you a little bit. I know some of you guys are yeah. going to say, you didn't take our questions and we're so sorry. We did get many of your questions from last time and we will go through this again. And um, when we send you materials, if there's ways in which we can provide um, answers to your questions through materials, we definitely will get those to um, the nonprofit quarterly so that they can get it out to you. That was a lot. <laughs> yeah, and there, were, there are so many notes of thanks uh, in this Q&A box, as hopefully you've seen throughout the conversation, this real appreciation for the combination of theory and practice and just real world experience um, and guidance. So thank you both again for all the work that went into both sessions, for the responsiveness of session two, the pouring over people's questions and feedback after last week and providing so many tangible resources for us. And as Robin said, we'll, I've written down as many as I can and we'll go through this again and make sure that all those resources are in your follow-up email. I just wanna make a mention that a number of you said you didn't get the recording from session one. So do check your junk mail. Um, you should have, everybody who registered for session one got a recording. So um, please check your junk mail or, uh, to make sure because it's probably a large file. Okay. And I also found it on YouTube. Yes, I was just going to say, um, all of our recordings are on YouTube, so you can go to the NPQ channel uh, directly instead of going to your inbox and, and find it beyond the board statement. And in a couple of days, beyond the board statement two will be up there. Okay? The remix. <laughs> What's that? The, the remix. remix. The remix will be up as well. So not to worry, they will be on YouTube in a few days. All right. Again, thanks to everybody and thanks to the you know, thousands of people <laughs> over the course of the last uh, eight days who have participated and responded to your work, Robin and Vernetta. Thank you very much. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. And thanks everyone who attended. Yes. Um, we, we, this, this, is, this is more than what we dreamed of having. And so we, we know that you're gonna go forward and do this amazing work in your communities. So thank yeah. you for what you're doing and what you're going to do. And good luck. Yes. <laughs> right.